Okay, hi there, and welcome to Basketball Ireland celebration of Women in Sport Week. And um, my name is Erin Bracken, and I am the South Dublin Development Officer, and um, with Basketball Ireland. And I am delighted to be joined by um, these wonderful women that are involved in basketball: uh, Paula Mullins Cleary, Deborah McCardle, Emma Perry, and Deirdre Brennan. As we discuss coaching and officiating, and everybody's kind of experiences in basketball to date. Um, so welcome, and thanks so much for joining me. Um, firstly, I suppose I'm just going to give you all like a couple of minutes to give us a bit of background on yourselves and your career and just talk a little bit about your journey into sport and then we'll delve a little bit deeper then specifically um, with who's involved in coaching and officiating. So um, if any of you want to kick it off. Deirdre? So shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Deirdre Brennan. Um, Played uh, originally from Monaghan, so played schools basketball for uh, the Louis and Monaghan and community games with the local parish donor. Uh, came to Ulster University, trained as a physical education teacher, played National League basketball with a club called Sporting Belfast, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, got into coaching very early, probably when I was about 15 or so, when the boys team had no coach at home for community games. So I was roped into it that way and um, work in the area of sport. I, I, I teach um, at Ulster University in the School of Sport. So that's my background. Emma? Uh, yeah, um, Emma Perry, uh, FIBA official. I started refereeing in school uh, purely to get out of class. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I progressed onto the pathway program, which was basically like a, a bit like the Players Academy now. So it was a bit of a identifying talent. Spent a few years on that, made the step down to National League. And um, then I was unfortunately injured for maybe 10 years. And then while I was off the court, I went into kind of the education and tutoring aspect of it. So I actually learned an awful lot off the court while injured that I could bring back on court when I came back. So I came back officiating in, I'd say, 2015. And then I went from my FIBA license in 2017. So I got my FIBA license in 2017 and I've been progressing from there. So European Games, pre-qualifiers for the Eurobasket and obviously National League across both men's and women's in, in Ireland. So that's a little bit about myself. Brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Um, Paula? Hi, um, Paula Mullins. I started out playing, um, like Deirdre, uh, schools basketball and community games and that. I wasn't a very good player. So then Martin Hare came to do a course, a referees course in 96 into St. Leo's in Carlo and uh, delighted to take part. And from there, we went to Dungarvan. And um, as Emma mentioned, then the Pathway programme with um, Pat, Pat Kiley, Martin Hare and Tony Hayes at that stage. I moved on then to be an administrator of that programme and kind of stayed involved in the administrative side of refereeing for a good number of years. Um, then when I moved to Dublin, I kind of I moved on to the men's board and I was treasurer of the Dublin men's board for a number of years. Um, and then I had my little boy, I had Ryan, and just kind of my perspective changed a little bit and I wasn't enjoying my refereeing when I came back after, let's say, maternity leave. Um, so then Jerry approached me, Jerry Kelly approached me and asked me to um, come on board with the commissioners. But it's kind of taken the rules to the next level then to make sure that the games at National League level um, get to happen and uh, through the regulations and that everything goes OK um, during the games. So I um, then moved on. Um, thankfully, they nominated me the um, Commissioner's Committee last kind of April, May, um, nominated me for FIBA Commissioner position so I went forward with the FIBA referees during last summer. Deborah McCardle I'm a FIBA level table official um, at the moment um, I probably have tried my hand at every single thing that it exists except commissioner in basketball I started playing um, in secondary school went on to club games uh, I set up my own club in um, Coolock in Dublin and um, ran that for a number of years. I tried my hand at refereeing and while I was in the club, we did the table officials course and I, I loved, to, I, I just love the, uh, um, the rules and, you know, been all how it's all black and white, you know, so I love all the rules of the table officiating. Um, continued to play for until I had uh, my children. Uh, 
and coach as well. And um, then when the club, when my children went on to um, bring up my children, so the club felt went aside. And then I, I was administrator with the Dublin Ladies Basketball Board for uh, the treasurer for the Double A's basketball for, board uh, for a good few years um, and met um, people like Margaret Miley and Sheila Galick and Stella Hickey and things like that. And that's when I started kind of really getting involved in negotiating. So um, moved on from then. Um, I now coach Special Olympics as well and involved in that as well. So and I also set up a program for um, coaching Special Olympic athletes as table officials and have been to two World Games um, with Special Olympics in that capacity. So, um, yeah, that's all my story. Brilliant. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'm going to specifically target each of you now and kind of go a little bit deeper into your kind of careers and some of your insights. Um, I suppose this obviously is Women in Sport Week. So we are kind of hoping that this is going to reach a certain audience, you know, like of young girls or even women that may have fallen out of sport at some stage and are maybe looking to get back involved again. Um, so just whatever you have to share um, will be brilliant. So Emma, I suppose we're going to start with you. And um, you kind of mentioned a little bit about your FIBA, um, you know, your time as a FIBA referee and, you know, after getting your license in 2017, I think you said. And yeah. um, so I know you kind of talked a little bit about how you've gotten into that and um, just, you know, describe what it's like to be traveling, you know, Europe, I suppose, and, you know, refereeing at that level. And so maybe some of the differences between that level and, you know, here in Ireland and um, just anything that you've noticed in your experience for the past couple of years. Yeah, it's, well, as you said, it's, it's an honor because you get to, to travel the world and, and a lot of the places you go, it's um, places that you wouldn't necessarily see as holiday destinations. So, it, you know, you get to tick off places that you'd never get to visit. My first example, even pre fever would have been I was in Brazil at the World School Games. And I suppose it just gives you that feeling of, you know, accomplishment once you get there. But also, you know, there's so much to see. And it's giving you the opportunity to, to learn while also broadening your experience in life, you know. Um, and if you're talking about the differences, I suppose it, it's like everything. Um, and I think in the last couple of years, we've really seen Irish basketball standard raise, raise itself from, from underage to like, even if you look previously, like over the last couple of weeks with the men and the pre-qualifiers, the women, the same thing. So for me, it's, it's great to see that the level that I get to see abroad is now coming home. To, to to flourish as they would say because getting to travel with the underage teams at the Euros is, is phenomenal to, to see the, the joy it, it's even about the joy of competing and that it's the same for me you know as as an Irish FIBA there are certain expectations and they're not always good expectations it's like well you're an Irish FIBA so maybe you'll get to do A or B or C so you know it, it's about setting yourself those achievable goals and anything else is a bonus and what I've seen over the last number of years is across the Irish Fevers and especially we'll say from my side as being a female is that we've got to make that next step like last year I got to to referee in the, the Euro League women's which was again something that as an Irish Fever your expectation isn't really there but with the the level that's growing here because then our games that we're officiating week in week out are rising then our our um talent itself is going with it so for me abroad you see a lot more professionalism and that's not a, a bad thing on us it's more about the the money aspect and you know the people involved and it's to get to see of how if we continue to progress at the level we are progressing what's to come and that's for me the, the differences you see but also the what would you say even the likes of the facilities. The facilities is a big thing that, that you would see the difference in from tra traveling abroad and coming home. But again, you can also see that each and every year that it is growing here. So it, it's the differences I'd say are purely, they're very attainable for, for us, I believe, if things keep going the way they're going and the structures that are put in place, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the fact that, you know, we have yourself and there's a couple of others as well with their FIBA licenses, the more obviously that we have of that, the more professional, you know, it might become here in Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, the more people that are getting to experience that abroad. Um, I suppose then, you know, yourself, obviously being a female referee, how difficult is it, you know, to get women involved in refereeing? And I know myself and Deirdre can see it from a coaching standpoint, but even from a refereeing standpoint, it's similar, you know, like there isn't that many, you know, female officials, it's probably growing a little bit, but um, just, you know, 
any tips or any advice for young girls or even for not not even so much young girls, maybe players that like past players, you know, that might be looking to get involved in refereeing? Um, again, I think as a, as a country and, you know, Paul will emphasize this and again, the ladies that have traveled with, with, with Euro teams, we're actually streets ahead of many European countries in relation to our female officials and you know we have a good few female officials in our top leagues over here which isn't really heard of in other countries so again it's about showing the, the younger people or the inexperienced officials who say if they're past players and they're coming in that it, it is attainable and you can reach the top level and for me it, you know Paula discussed about being a player I also played I got like most improved player for four years on the shot so that'll tell you how bad I was I think I could catch the ball at the end of the four years um, and <laughs> so when I had the the opportunity to, to referee and referee at a higher standard and um, it just it gave me something that I could control and and attain and again it's it's about knowing that you know just because I wasn't able to to rise in one aspect of the sport it didn't rule it out completely and I think it's, it's about that it's about having the self-awareness yeah. and the knowledge to know you know just because I'm not good at an aspect of it doesn't mean that I can't go further and I think that's that's very important and especially we say as, as young girls I was involved in the hackathon during lockdown and one of the major things that was coming across was that females at a certain age felt it was too competitive and um, and again what I would say is about refereeing is you know we're not competing we're there to facilitate and, and to ensure that the games go ahead so again if you're someone that you know isn't really able for that sheer competitiveness then officiating is a, is a great thing to get into and um, and again, it still keeps you involved. Your knowledge is constantly growing and, and there is still that sense of achievement like that. If it's, you know, you started under 10s and, you know, even the under 10 leagues and the under 12s, they have cup semifinals, they have finals. And to them, that is their national cup final. So if, if referees can see that, you know what, if, if we start like the kids and, and find an aspect and a route to go through, then absolutely. So that would be my, my main thing. And especially for females to get them involved. It is achievable. And, and again, for us, if you look at our top league, if you look at myself and now Neve with her, her FIBA, so we've now two female FIBAs getting to travel. Europe, Paul is the same in the commission and role. So I, I think this year, especially, it's, it's great to have these discussions and the fact that we have now visibility. And it goes back to FIBAs. If you can't see, you can't do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose then Deirdre we'll talk a little bit to you next maybe we'll come to you about your kind of coaching career and you kind of touched on it a little bit that you got involved quite early um, and just because of I suppose you feeling like oh there was somebody a team was stuck and you had to go and try and give back but obviously you've grown into now one of the top female coaches in the country in terms of being that role model and a visibility there so if you want to just go into a little bit more detail about your coaching career so far and some of your memories. Sure. Um, it was my dad who actually was, he got me into everything that was sport related. And as I said, it was community games. You know what communities like, you know, pulling a stack of sporty kids who do everything. And uh, the girls team was quite good. So the boys wanted to get on the bandwagon. So that's why I got involved then. Um, but I suppose I, once I went to university, I studied in sport, you know, I did. And then, uh, then I trained to be a PE teacher. So my background is sort of in that area. Um, tips for me would be, you know, try and get into coaching early or try to really try to attract females into coaching early. I'm sure Emma and Co would say the same about officiating. Um, the earlier you get them involved, the more it can become part of their lifestyle, not unlike playing. You know, you want to get them engaged early so it becomes part of something that they do in their lives. <laughs> Um, because I think one of the barriers for, for female coaching, certainly the barriers that I faced, um, not so much coaching just at collegiate level, but when we moved our collegiate team to Super League, um, it was a much bigger commitment. And at that stage, I was married with, with two, maybe three small kids. So then it was the time um, because it's very on social hours for males and for females. But I think that the traditionally females tend to manage more um of family life um so i mean the club was great i mean they shifted traditionally what would have been a six to eight practice to an eight to ten practice so that i would have an opportunity to get the kids down and into bed and then go to practice uh which worked really well when gareth wasn't playing <laughs> didn't work just as well when he was part of the team uh because we needed to get babysitters so there was a cost associated with that so it sort of costs you to coach as i think all of us probably know um 
but it is about trying to facilitate, you know, recognize what the barriers are and then trying to take those barriers away. Um, it is, it can be a lonely place, but I think it, coaching can be a lonely place, whether you're male or female, but it can be extra lonely if you're one of the few females in what is uh, an environment which is very dominated by male coaches. And that's not a fault of the male coaches, it's just a fault of the culture more than anything. And I have had some negative experiences um, in terms of um, comments being passed or judgments being made about a female coaching um, a men's team. Um, but I think I didn't enter into it thinking I never thought twice about coaching guys. I don't know whether it's because I had that early exposure when I was young. Um, so when, I, when the team at the university asked me, you know, to coach them, um, I didn't think twice. You know, I didn't think, oh, you know, it would be weird to be coaching guys. I just did it. I didn't actually think twice of it. Yeah. Why did it? Um, but then you can come up against maybe um, some sort of stereotypical views where people think that it's inappropriate for you to be in those sorts of positions but equally I remember coaching some of my very early varsities and we were very strong we had the likes of Adrian Fulton at college Gareth Kevin Craig Paul Rigby you know re really established players so we were very good at varsity level but I do remember um, female students coming up and passing comments saying we think it's great that you know that you're coaching a men's team so I think you don't mean to put yourself in that situation but maybe others notice or maybe pay attention to it in a way that yeah. you don't necessarily I'm sure you're the same Aaron when, when, when you're coaching the men's team now to you it's just coaching to me it was just coaching it just happened to be males in front of me um, and I've I've done a lot of coaching of I mean I'm involved with mostly female basketball now I've done both so I mean it's a richly richly rewarding um vocation to be involved in I think it is a vocation though you know you don't it costs yeah. you money it costs you strife it costs you time you don't sleep at night in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know all of the above and you ask yourself Absolutely. Oh, I volunteer to do this what am I thinking you know um but I suppose the joy is is what you get out of it you know and the improvements that you can see your players make it's um you know, working with with particularly the stage that we're at, where we have some kids coming from school, transitioning into university life and transitioning into more senior basketball, because um, that's quite a difficult transition, even, you know, for good players who have been good underage, but also for others where you're trying to hang on to them because they haven't been the stars at underage, but you can see so much potential in them if they stick at it. So, I mean, it's um, it's a very rewarding um activity to be involved in but there certainly are barriers for females so I would say have interventions that get young girls involved in coaching early um, so they get that sort of experience of of working with young people and you know the affirmations have been involved and they'll, they'll see particularly if they work maybe with younger Emma referred to like under 10s or whatever I mean, the kids will just love them, you know, and that's very affirming then for a young novice coach. It's not necessarily about knowledge. It's more about your ability to relate to the, to, to the kids. And that's, you know, it's about sending them out of the gym, feeling good about themselves, not yeah. necessarily that they can nail the layup, but that they feel great as a result of being involved in basketball and are itching to come back. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was similar to yourself in terms of getting involved in coaching early. I would have been 15 as well and just decided I wanted to go back and coach an under 10 team like like that in Liffey Celtics in the academy, which happened to be my sister's team. Um, and then similar to you as well, ended up in a career, you know, like in sport and ended up coming up to Ulster University and studying sports coaching and performance on your programme. So um, I definitely wouldn't have seen that route you know, I wouldn't have gone down that route if I hadn't gotten involved in coaching at the age that I did, you know, so I definitely agree with you on that front that it's important I, to try and get any players, anybody that's involved. I remember the conversation at uh, Kira's under 16 Euros where I said, why don't you come north, Erin, and do a master's in sports coaching? Yeah, and it was probably two <laughs> years after that, playing. I think. Yeah, yeah, I was probably still in my undergrad at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, sure, that ended up happening. So um, also didn't mention at the start, Deirdre, but congratulations on the women's team and winning the northern conference thank you very much yeah so you can on. see that coaching fruition come to yeah 
Um, so Deirdre, thanks a million for that. Um, so De Deborah, we'll move on to you and talk a little bit about you know, your career and some of your experiences. I know you talked about trying everything at Bayerk commissioner but you're involved in all aspects of the sports so um just tell us a little bit about your life as a FIBA table official and how you began your journey into it okay um well the, yeah the journey began in, in when I had the club when I ran the club and just I had to learn how to do the table so that we could have trained the other kids that were there to actually do the table some uh, some very hairy stories about how to stop a clock without somebody hold back a clock but anyway uh, there is um, <laughs> there is started started in that and then went on coaching and things like that and then came back to to table officiating um after i had my family um and as i said i just loved i love the um i love you know the rules and the, the way it's all organized you know um we're uh, the table officials. I, I was on the National Table Officials Associate or National Table Officials Committee as well. I sat on that for a long time. Um, we're an, in a different place than every other um, situation, like coach and referee and, and commissioners. Um, there is actually way, way, way more women table officials than there are men. So um, we are women in sports and table officiating. Um, there are it's predominantly women that um, do table officiating in, in Ireland. I don't know, Emma might have it, it might know, she would be more knowledgeable abroad, but um, in Ireland it is predominantly, I say 90% is actually women um, that, that do table in, in at, up, even up, up to National League games. Um, so uh, the, I then a couple of years back, um, we we looked into doing um, the FIBA um, standards um, and about four of us did that at the time. And then this year, or earlier on last year, sorry, there was, I can't remember what the actual figure is, but um, there was a big cohort of um, people that um, sat and passed the exam um, to become FIBA table officials because of the fact that we were hosting, Ireland were hosting national or international games, we needed to have uh, FIBA qualified table officials um, in the country. Um, but the, the, I think the first one was the European um, Championships, the women's one. Um, that's when we, we first sat the FIBA exams. Um, more, most recently, we have been using the digital score sheet, and that's only been used in Ireland at international games so far. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be um, at and uh, the national league games in the future um it's quite technical but it's really really interesting and it is the way forward you know what i mean um for a table officiating and there's more things coming on board um as well um but uh it's exciting it's adrenaline there's a lot of adrenaline it's more actually i can see the difference over the last few years as well in that in table officiating in that we now work more as a team with the referees. It used to be referees and table officials. And um, now it's, we are much more, it's in the last few years, it's totally that we're a team with the referees, which is really progressive and, you know, it works really, really well. Um, but yeah, no, um, I do agree about getting in young, getting in early. Table officiate, especially, um, I think, it's there are some people children adults who don't want to play who don't want to referee who want to be involved in the game generally they become administrators or managers and things like this but table officiating is is a way especially if you are technical interested in maths that sort of you know rules and things like that i um, table officiating is um, one a really good way to get involved um, in the game, at, even at a young level, if you don't want to play or if you're finished your playing career or your refereeing career and you want to stay in the game, table officiating is um, uh, something that would keep you in the game up to FIBA level if you wish, you know what I mean? So. Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, and then Paula, welcome back. Oh, sorry, um, technical issues. You're okay. Um, you look like you're out in the sun there. Uh, yeah. So, 
you mentioned your kind of journey a little bit into becoming a FIBA um, commissioner. Um, I believe you had your first game in December. Is that correct? It did, yeah. A yeah. Women's so Euro just, Cup game yeah. in, in um, La Rochelle. It was just, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. so completely... Um, next level if you like from where we are in Ireland but just even the size of the gym as Emma was mentioning the facilities they're not very glamorous either like we had to leave at four o'clock the next morning to come home from the game and stuff like that but um, just I suppose when we qualified and we had our commissioner training um, weekend in Munich that was in November as well for all the new commissioners let's say for this this two-year period um, we the, the FIBA CEO um, Camille was there and it's just I suppose when we go out to a commission a game in Europe we're representing him and representing FIBA so that was kind of something that I didn't realize at the time if you like but it was kind of him putting in in black and white what our, our role is there to make sure that the game happens and that it happens within the regulations that FIBA have set down for the different types of leagues or whatever much like what you do in Ireland but um it's just on this this next level which is um definitely um it's it's an honor really I suppose to to be able to do it as well um I would never have dreamt of being FIBA at any at any level, let's say, because I wasn't a good enough referee, but being a FIBA commissioner now is just it's a it's a real honour, um, and I'm delighted. It's, it's so good. It's brilliant. So what what's the next steps now? Have you got any games coming up? Or? Um, hopefully now the European Championships and the the underage sets of games that will follow during the summer. Um, so as Emma said, you kind of have to, um kind of see or prioritise what you're going to maybe as Ireland as a commissioner. I know Declan Murray is our uh, our male commissioner and has been our commissioner for a number of years. So Declan would have had um, a number of uh, appointments before Christmas. Um, so I got my my first one, which is brilliant. So I kind of have to be realistic as in what I'm going to get for this season. And we're into the business end of all the leagues and stuff like that. So as a newbie, I'm not expecting anything between now and the summer, but hopefully um, for the summer tournaments, you know, the under 16s, under 18s under 20s um we see where they are and obviously we have to make yourself available then with your holiday leave and stuff like that as well so hopefully um i'd be hopeful to get at least one appointment during the summer so fingers crossed and then we'll see what next season brings then as in with the leagues and the cups then when they all kick back off at then in september for europe brilliant um and just i suppose similar to the Rest of the panelists are talking about kind of encouraging girls to get involved, you know, on any level. Um, just if you have any advice or tips or. Um... Well, um, you, you mentioned earlier that you spoke to Katrina White today. Like she's a pure example of being able to stay involved in sport. Um, and she is now as a, a, you know, she's a grade one referee now. So she would never have thought back in her days playing with uh, Wildcats or whatever, or even coming her whole way through um, that she would have gotten there. So she's an example of um, starting your career out as a player, but then being able to adapt. And that's what um, you guys as coaches, you've been able to do that, although you came directly let's say for, as a coach but um table official is the exact same i've been at a couple of national league games lately where former uh, national league referees are now doing the 24 second shot clock on national league games you know so like there's loads of avenues there like the rules are there and um, they get tweaked every now and again but they're they're mainly the same rules and you know if you've gone out at one set yes you may need to do a little bit of extra work or whatever but there's always the opportunity to come back Back in and clubs are crying out for volunteers um, and that's just another way to volunteer and I would say to younger people um, uh, to look at coaching or refereeing or um, table officiating as you're moving through the education system as well like I left Carlo um, as a very young naive uh, referee and I was able to move to Sligo to go to college and I got to play college basketball I got to coach a couple of games I got to referee I was able to move to Cork and referee and you were able to walk into gyms and see people and it's all about your camaraderie and your friends and your lifelong friends if you like 
um, and was my best friend, but I met her through pathways. Um, she was my bridesmaid. You know, these are the relationships that you build up as you're going through life. I'm sure Katrina would say the same as well. I'm sure Emma would say, you know, you're walking into different, um, you know, you guys yourselves, Deborah as well. You know, you're making your lifelong friendships as you're going through the sport and being able to do different roles within the sport. And it should thoroughly be encouraged. And as um, Deirdre was saying, to remove, if we could try and remove as, as many blood or roadblocks as we see along the way to help people stay in the sport or come back to the sport, absolutely we need to do it, you know, to, and especially to keep females on board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for that, Paula. I think when we talk about, you know, girls getting involved in sport and, you know, even some of the reasons for drop-offs, we look at how people say it gets too competitive or, you know, they get involved because of friends and, you know, like they join a sport because of friends. So the fact that you're all able to talk about memories that you have with one another through basketball and through sport it is what it's all about. Um, so just to finish off, I just want to ask you all to give me a quick um, kind of, I suppose, snippet of what one of your favourite basketball memories might be. Um, Deirdre, I know you might have a few in terms of maybe involved maybe as a player or whatever, but maybe as a coach um, to kind of fit on topic um, if you can pick one or two of your favorite coaching memories. <laughs> um, probably one of my, uh, one of the achievements that I thought maybe was um, best was actually when the first year um, Northern Ireland universities had a men's team in the British University Games, which is like a four country tournament, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales. And as you can imagine, based on the number of institutions in England, they pretty much win everything. They do this for every sport and it's it's everything. Everything comes together in the one campus. Um, and it was in England and we played Scotland and beat them in a very competitive game, beat them probably by about 16 or so in the end, but it wasn't that sort of a game. But at the start of that tournament, um, I'll not give you the year because somebody can eventually work out who it was. Um, as somebody related to the tournament pulled me and questioned me coaching the the men's northern ireland team in a derogatory way you know and i was stunned i mean i was literally gobsmacked um didn't know how to respond um except that i thought if we don't win this tournament i swear to god i'm gonna kill these guys <laughs> so we did ultimately beat england in the final of that tournament in, in a, and we beat them comfortably actually but i remember feeling you know that um I did have it it wasn't me needless to say we had a very strong team full of Irish internationals um and it was an amazing achievement for Northern Ireland universities we have two universities you know so it was a significant achievement given given the pool of players but we did have very we had a lot of quality players um and at the award ceremony that night every coach had the opportunity to nominate an MVP and you couldn't nominate, you could nominate from your own team if you wanted to. Now, we had such a strong team. I could have picked four or five from our team. But there was no real standout because we were strong. Um, so I nominated somebody um, from Scotland who ultimately won it. But the same person questioned um, my nomination for the MVP. And uh, I remember saying, have you questioned every other coach's nomination? And at this stage, I didn't know who won it, you know, so um I think that, that felt special because we won and um, the, the team knew about what this person had said. So I think if anything, it sort of revved them up a little bit, you know, in sort of support of me. So that was probably one of the, what I consider bigger achievements. And one of the, sort of probably the larger tournaments that I had coached in at that stage of my career as well. Outside of that, I mean, I have great memories of coaching my own girls. Like I have three girls, they all play. It's so much fun just getting them involved and seeing them progress through. Very challenging also coaching your own kids as if you, I'm sure if you're coaching your own sibling is challenging as well because you have to be coach as opposed to be mom. So it is very challenging, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So outside of that, it's really hard to select any one memory. Um, but the other one, simply because we're talking about women in sports, that one always stuck with me. The empowerment. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Deirdre. Um, Emma? Yeah, God, when you have to, you know, pick one, it's, it's very difficult. There's, there's a couple that stand out. Um, and actually, one of them is related to refereeing Special Olympics. And Deborah, you know, you know yourself that 
the sense of pride and, and the, the love that you feel when you're doing it. And I remember we were doing the, must have been the national games and they were in the arena and this, this kid came up to me and they were a little bit upset and I asked if they were all right or if they wanted to sub. And she told me she was just a little bit scared, but if I could hold her hand, she'd, she'd stay on. And I refereed, so you say, the last couple of minutes holding her hand and it just, it was like, it took away from the competitiveness, you know, am I doing a good job? Am I not? You know, it was about the inclusion. It was about the, the love of the sport that everybody in the gym had. And it, it's a memory that I'll, I'll hold forever. And it was just, it was phenomenal. Um, and then I just picked two other ones. One was when I got to be nominated as crew chief for one of the European games. And it was, again, because we're speaking about females in sport, it was my, my two colleagues were, were male. And to see my name and, and the Irish flag at the top was just, again, you know, it was a sense of achievement, but, but also that you could look at it and it wasn't a female, it was an Irish FIBA was top. And that to me is about how we eradicate the, the, the male slash female and, and make it attainable to everybody. And the other outstanding memory I have, and it, it's for Paula, and it's when Paula got her first game this year, myself and Magic, she got to travel with Magic because it was on the game, but I had a game also in Europe and we all got to be in the airport on the same day, catching the same flight. And it was just that overall, sense. you talk about memories and it's to see your friends excel in the job that they love and memories like that can be bought. So that would be my main one. Well, thanks for that, Emma. Uh, Deborah. Um, well, as a table official, I suppose, again, Special Olympics comes into it because I've been to two World Games um, and I wouldn't have gotten to the two World Games if it wasn't for me being a table official, a basketball table official. Um, uh, so those are huge. There's such huge achievements there, you know, and uh, it has helped Ireland are the leading light in that um, we um, are we were the only country that had table officials as uh, athletes as table officials at World Games in LA and then we had one one from America but we had one two I think we had five at um, Abu Dhabi and um, so we we're kind of leading the way in that respect um, and then another one of my table officials is being appointed to the inter any of the international games. It's um, it's you you do you do feel really proud to be there. And when it, the kids in school are watching the match on telly and they come in the next day, we saw you on the telly. You know, I mean, so they're they're all delighted to see so do you know that they don't realise that I'm still involved in the game or anything like that. You know, so um. They they love seeing you on the telly and telling their parents and everything that, you know, I work in the school and things like that, you know, so. Um, but yeah, it's great to be to be there at the top level of the game, uh, you know, and I never thought that at my age I'd be involved, you know, that, at, at the top level of the game. now. So it's brilliant. That's it. I really, really enjoy it. Thanks, Debra. And Paula, lastly. Um, same, I suppose, as the ladies. Um, my big one with women in sport, obviously, was to get my um, appointment as um, commissioner for the Euro Cup uh, women's game before Christmas. That was just amazing. And just as Emma said, to see the little flag there and Paula Mullins Cleary. I have to use uh, I have to use my married name um, because of my passport. So people are getting confused. Who's this Paula Cleary one? Uh, but uh, yeah, so that that has been amazing. And then I suppose um, I it was the previous year with COVID gone it was my uh, appointment as uh, commissioner for the, the the women's cup game um the previous January when we played it last month this one gone now with this one would have been an honor as well but was my first um time to work with um TV and um like to work with the the guys in basketball HQ as well that's fantastic as well like but um it was just it was nerve-wracking because it was my first one then as well as in live on TV and I had uh, all the guys set up at home kind of watching and keep an eye out it'll only be a split second like because obviously the referees and everybody else gets the table official we get very little uh uh time on tv but um that was like a, a really uh, an amazing feeling but uh truly honorable was um the nomination for the euro, euro cup game at christmas so that was amazing as well so. 
<laughs> thanks so much. Um, so I suppose we'll wrap it up there. I uh, just want to thank each of you for giving up your time. Um, it's been brilliant. I know we probably could talk for so much longer about all the different memories and share so many stories and, you know, talking about challenges and barriers and um, positive memories as well. So just want to say thanks a million. Um, the experience that you all have in your respective fields has been is, is unbelievable. Um, best of luck to you all for the rest of the season and hopefully I will see you on a basketball court um soon anyway i see most of you all the time but um yeah just thanks a million and then just for everybody that's going to be watching and um, for all the latest content from women at sport week just stay tuned on our social channels and to the basketball Ireland website at ireland.basketball um, we we're hoping to populate that over the coming week with different kind of content and stuff so uh thanks very much again